Good morning to each of you across the African, the Canadian uh, beautiful country as well as the African continent. It is wonderful to welcome hundreds of you to today's webinar on natural resource development and the incredible good that's being done through Canadian thought leadership and practice in partnership with African leaders on the ground across the continent. It is my great privilege to welcome your excellencies, the head of Global Affairs Canada, staffers and trade commissioners from the Canadian government, as well as those of you working uh, across corporations and small businesses throughout the supply chain in this area where Canada certainly leads with investment amounting to billions of dollars on the continent, as well as two-way trade and investment. At this particular point, I want to thank each one of our all-star panelists who've joined us today. We've got Ben Chalmers, Wayne Floriani, uh, we've got Ryan, Asim Lari over in Botswana, and Jamie Webb. I want to thank each one of you for what you're doing and for the recognition um, that we certainly, as a chamber, give to each of your individual efforts, as well as the collective efforts of your organizations and companies. Uh, we, without further ado, I'm going to quickly sketch the program. We'll be kicking straight off with the panel discussion. Following the panel, I'll invite Susan Namulindwa, our Vice President in Ottawa, to offer some concluding remarks. And in fact, Susan, if I may, I see uh, you are on at the moment. Um, could I invite you to start, Susan, with some opening remarks, um, and then we'll get into the panel, and I'll be doing introductions for each one of our fantastic speakers today. Susan Namulindwa is Vice President, not only of the Canada-Africa Chamber of Business, but she also serves as head of the Africa Trade Desk in Ottawa. Susan, it's wonderful to have you here and kick us off with opening remarks. Thank you, Gareth. It gives me great pleasure to welcome all our partners and friends from around the world to today's conversation. As the Canada Africa Chamber of Business, we are very encouraged and inspired to continue these sessions because of the interest and participation of people from all sectors and walks of life. This indicates a willingness from many stakeholders to make significant, bold and timely changes and leaning away from business as usual. Your presence and engagement here today is truly appreciated and valued. And even in this virtual space with uh, technical difficulties, we can give ourselves a pat on the shoulders. Our topic today has big words that can sometimes get lost in the jargon and lose their true meaning from constant use. Just a couple of examples stronger. When we think about strength, I am stronger than an average five-year-old. But when you put me against my 15-year-old six-foot-four teenager or a boxer, they will stamp me into pieces and really put, a, put in context that we have to, med to measure strength. When we talk about sustainability and development, both these words get used and abused left and right, so we won't even go there. When it comes to community, you can ask yourselves, what does this really mean? Most times it depends on who you ask. Which gets me to leadership. Leadership is the most interesting of the words highlighted today. And in this context, the mining sector can indeed lead the transformation, starting with small changes. It's just a couple of examples when it comes to the environment we can talk about controlling and aiming to meet greenhouse emission targets or responsible water use, wastewater management to avert water wars on the continent, or even just reducing the amount of fossil fuels and incorporating solar power and other alternative energies. We could talk about recycling. Recycling, I love being an environmental chemist. Uh, heavy uh, recycling of metals, uh, heavy machinery, tires, used equipment, or adapting better extraction technologies and methods. When we talk about women, like Canada has a strong women in Canadian mining um, organization. This could work with women in Africa mining to escape and break the roles that are generally assigned to them because of their gender. We could talk about wages and skills training, which directly impacts the economic well-being of the communities, in, in essence, making them stronger. We could talk about the youth. We know, and it's documented about the youth population in Africa. What we need to talk about is education, training, skills and knowledge transfer, 
to employ the to employ them more and mentor them into better opportunities at home so they can have a future and dissuade them from um, brain drain and restlessness we could talk about developing local capacity refining or processing on the continent to add value as exposed to uh, just extra, uh, as, a, as opposed to just extracting and just exporting the ores. Within each of these challenges is highlighted an opportunity for growth, both for the Canadian businesses doing business there and the communities in which they work. In the end, building stronger communities boils down to evening the balance of trade between the continent and Canada and our other partners. Just in real numbers, Canada's trade with the whole continent of Africa, while it is growing, still represents less than 0.9% of the total trade. And this is mostly driven by the mining sector, the mining industry, who we have here today. So it highlights the opportunity that in the mining industries where Canada and Africa can both make quick, meaningful gains to start addressing, addressing the imbalance. That is why I am so excited. I can hardly get my awards out. I'm excited to welcome the dream panel we have today to get us on this path of stronger communities. This panel is in the trenches, no pun intended, and I'm delighted to have them share their insights today. Back to you, Gareth. Susan, thank you so much. Susan Namolindwa, our Vice Chair for Canada here at the Chamber. And I just want to recognize you, Susan, for your pioneering leadership and your passion and the scientific rigor that you bring to the, to the Chamber, asking some of those tough questions and formulating these sorts of panels with us. Uh, we really thank you for that. Um, without further ado, off to our panel and starting uh, right now with our first speaker, representing the Mining Association of Canada. Ben Chalmers has been responsible for the Organizations Towards Sustainable Mining Initiative, or TSM. This award-winning program is focused on enabling mining companies to meet society's needs for minerals, for metals, and for energy products in a way that is inherently socially, economically, and environmentally sustainable. And he's going to discuss a few details on some of the various programs and initiatives that they are working on. Ben, your leadership is recognized globally. You're a sought-after speaker. You freely said yes and even called me during your vacation saying you want to be a part of this and keep driving the incredible message and best practice that Canadian companies are demonstrating. It's a great pleasure to welcome you as our opening panelist at today's webinar. Over to you, Ben. Thank you, Gareth, for that uh, wonderful, uh, very generous uh, introduction. It's a pleasure to speak to everyone uh, today, even if I can't be in front of you and speaking with you in person. It's, it's wonderful that we can connect this way uh, by technology. Uh, I wanted to share a few slides with you highlighting um, initially just sort of the, the, the level of importance um, that, uh, of Africa in, uh, in the context of Canadian mining and, and highlight some of the interesting work and programs that some of our members are doing and i'll just conclude with a little bit about some of the priorities that we have for our work uh, internationally and, and and with africa specifically uh, just wanted to to give a, a quick acknowledgement of, of the the members that we have that have interests in africa uh, several of these are canadian-based companies like b2 gold trevally i am gold Barrick and and uh, and others, Kinross and others uh, are are um, global multinationals that we work with. Uh, Mac has a relatively unique uh, role in terms of national mining associations, in that most of the global mining associations uh, work on domestic mining policy. Uh, for us, it's a bit different, given the size of the Canadian mining industry abroad. We have a unique role of working with our members around mining policy, both in Canada and, and how Canadian mining is reflected internationally. So we work very closely with these members on, on, uh, on mining in Africa. This is some data coming out of Natural Resources Canada that shows the, the value of Canadian mining assets abroad. Uh, and you can see that while most of the value is concentrated in the Americas, uh, Africa is, is a very significant part of that accounting for 
uh, over $26 billion in, uh, in 2018, which is the latest data that's available, making it the second most important region outside of South America uh, for us. Uh, it also has about 103 active Canadian mining companies um, working across the continent. And you can see that most of the countries there by the nature of the different colors have some degree of Canadian investment. Uh, you know, I've had the pleasure of, of uh, traveling annually to Africa for the mining in Daba for five years now and, uh, and having a chance to visit uh, other countries um, around that, including most of Southern Africa, as well as some countries in Western Africa. And it's always a highlight of my year to get out and and see the, the work that's being done and, and have a chance to connect with African communities. Um, so it's just, yeah, just wanted to, to mention that. Um, a few specific examples, uh, both on the financial and social sides. Um, this is some data that uh, the Trevally, uh, one of our newer members has shared. Uh, it's uh, first wanted to point out, and this is a, this is a common theme that you'll see amongst uh, Canadian mining companies in terms of the distribution of, of employment. Uh, on the top, you'll see the number of expatriate workers, as well as local workers. And almost always when you have a Canadian company uh, working abroad, and especially Africa, you find a very, very high percentage of local, econ uh, local employees. We place a very important role on that local economic uh, development. Uh, a large effort goes into training and capacity building to make sure that we can continue to draw these kind of percentages uh, from the local workforce. Also interesting is, is uh, the data below that focuses on, on community investments and taxes. Uh, and you know, what, you'll, what you'll see here, uh, and Trevally operates in, in Burkina Faso and Namibia. Uh, they're a zinc miner. And the, the, the largest number that jumps out there, of course, is, is, the, is the amount spent on royalties uh, combined with other taxes um, dwarfs the amount spent on salaries. And, and I don't have uh, uh, supplier uh, costs here uh, or, uh, or other data that's, that sometimes that's, can be relevant here, but um, it, it's a significant contribution to the, the bottom line of, of the host country governments. Uh, for the countries that, that Trevally operates in. The next, uh, the next um, example comes from B2 Gold. Um, very similar data presented differently. Interesting here is the graph on the bottom that shows that uh, the largest percent spend uh, um, for, for B2 Gold, and this is consistent with all of our members, is the amount of money paid to su suppliers. And a couple of years ago, uh, we did a study understanding how much of that spend is local uh, versus how much of it is international. And on average, uh, we found that 80% of, of the money spent on, on the supply chain by a miner um, is spent locally within the host country. Uh, that ranges, of course. I mean, the lowest uh, country uh, percentage was about 27% in Mauritania. Um, and then there was up to into the 90s. Uh, but a very significant amount of the largest percentage of the spend annually um, is, is spent on suppliers and, and a significant part of that is spent on the local, uh, uh, local economy. Uh, if you look on the data on the top here, um, you'll also notice again that payments to governments in, in the forms of different taxes make up a significant amount of, uh, of the uh, value that's being spent. Uh, by by um, these companies and the, the, these two mines specifically. This is B2 Gold's global operations, but um, Fekula is in uh, in Mali and, uh, and and the other mine here is in Namibia. Um, sort of moving on to so just some interesting case studies that I uh, managed to uh, get from some of my members. These are two of the most significant investments in clean energy in Africa right now being led by two of our members, uh, both major solar plants, uh, one in uh, Namibia and one in uh, Burkina Faso. So I am Gold is in Burkina Faso and, and, uh, and uh, B2 Golds is in Namibia, or sorry, uh, B2 Golds is in, in Mali. Um, and you can see the significant impact this is having, uh, reducing uh, uh, millions of liters of diesel every year 
uh, and significant elimination of greenhouse gases. And it's, it's really, I think it's been wonderful to see the leadership um, that the mining industry and specifically your Canadian companies have played in the transition to, to uh, clean energy in Africa. Uh, and I'll show you a, a little bit later and some other uh, data, um, just how impactful this kind of work is, is also having on communities. Uh, another really interesting example is the work that our members are doing around biodiversity conservation and wildlife preservation. This is, a, this is an example from B2 Gold in Namibia around uh, some work that they're doing to set aside a significant portion of land, 1,800 hectares, as a wildlife reserve uh, that eventually will be integrated into a nearby natural or a national park. Um, and uh, they've had a chance to work with groups like the, the Cheetah Conservation Fund to uh, not only protect the cheetahs, but uh, reduce um, poaching efforts and take an inventory of, of the kinds of, uh, of species that are present. And what you'll see in that last point is just some of the surprises that they've, they've found when they actually took the time to do some of the, the research around identifying species. They found several species that they didn't expect to find. Uh, this is a really interesting project that actually uh, has has won a, an award that's given out by us annually uh, by our, our national stakeholder panel. We call our community of interest panel that um, reviews nominations and, and gives awards to outstanding projects every year. And this is a, a project uh, led by I am Gold in Burkina Faso around the Essekan mine um, to help. Uh, it was led by the women in the community who used to spend hours grinding flour with a mortar and pestle. Um, and they asked I am Gold to help them invest in a, in a grinding mill that uh, took that, um, took that uh, time spent grinding to down to two minutes and increase the quality, which has allowed them to build skills and invest in their own education. And a subsequent component of this project also saw the, the mine invest in various additional equipment, including things like welding to help the women uh, that we're interested start to build some skills around welding and manufacturing um, and it's been a, a huge uh, success and you can see in the bottom point here uh, that uh, some of the the results of this have been significant things like uh, the number of vulnerable households in the region has decreased by 50 percent and we're now seeing uh, the number of households that can actually manage a you know a basic expectation for us but the number of meals a day has has increased substan substantially uh, to from two meals a day to three meals a day. Similar stories uh, from all of our members. Here's a, here's a story from I am Goal or from uh, Travali in Namibia, where they have invested in the local community around economic diversification, tapping into some of the the artisan skills that the community has around leather working and and um, and uh, carpet weaving. And actually, if I'll just move the camera here, but the rug on the floor here. Uh, was something I brought back uh, uh, from from this uh, this school in uh, when I was there in February, and they just do outstanding work and and have uh, have seen some really impressive results around uh, around economic diversification. Um, an acknowledgement here around the work that we're doing with with uh, COVID and and um, uh, the sometimes you know many of our our members, especially in Africa. Uh, and, and other regions like South America have invested in, in working with the communities and helping to build the infrastructure around testing and controls. Uh, in fact, in some places, the, the mines are the only people able to do the testing, um, which is helping to, to understand and manage the outbreak in those countries. And the last example I wanted to share is, is from Kinross. Uh, and this is, uh, Kinross talks about the, the fact that they've, they've since 2004, they've spent $5.4 billion in Ghana and Mauritania with a 95% local workforce. And, and what, I mean, that's, a, that's a, a big, no, those are big numbers, but what's interesting here to me is the, is the graphs. And if you look at, um, this graph refers to something called zone A, which is, uh, you know, a zone of a concentric circle zone around the mine site. Um, and they've been tracking the, the percentage of, of poverty is defined by the, the number of families that live on less than a dollar a day. And in that region around the mine, that's, that's decreased from 28% in 2011 to 6% in 2017, and has had similar but not quite as steep decreases in, in the outer zones. Um, and if you look at what has been set uh, in, uh, in, um, in these countries around the uh, SDG goals for poverty alleviation, uh, it was set by 40%, 14% um, for, for one goal. Uh, 
in, by 2030 and, and they've already met that. Um, so they're well ahead of, of uh, helping these communities benefit. And then um, the, the increase in electrification, which helps a number of issues around poverty, but also economic diversification in the region has uh, increased steadily uh, around the mine as well. And then I just wanted to conclude with a note of a work that we're doing around a, a, a program that's really helping to share Canadian standards around uh, mining with respect to environmental and social practices called Towards Sustainable Mining. This was a program we've been using in Canada since 2004 that requires mine sites to invest or to, to sorry, publicly report their performance around in, uh, environmental and social aspects and have those independently verified. And we've, uh, we are sharing that um, globally now. And we signed our, up with our first partner country a couple of years ago in Africa, which is Botswana, and it continues to grow. Um, this is what our report looks like. Uh, and I chose this one specifically because this is I Am Gold um, reporting their performance last year uh, in a number of areas that I don't have time to go into, but areas like community engagement, safety, biodiversity, tailings, energy, and crisis management, and the Essekane mine, their mine in, in Burkina Faso is reported here, and actually uh, notably has better scores than, than the Canadian uh, mine, uh, Westwood. Uh, so that's been an impressive achievement. Uh, I wish I had a lot more time because there's so much going on with Canadian mining in Africa, but I will uh, leave it there and look forward to any discussion afterwards. And here's, of course, my contact information. Thank you very much, uh, Ben, and we'll share that contact information as well in a follow-up email um, and the presentations too. Well, thanks for that very broad macro overview on some of the great things and snapshots from individual companies. And I think it's quite appropriate that we move over now to one of the senior executives, in this case, the CEO level head of Lucara Diamond operating in Botswana, Nassim Lari, who's been spearheading some fantastic efforts in this regard. Uh, Ms. Lari is an accomplished professional accountant with a master's in strategic management and more than 17 years of experience in the mining industry, including a decade within corporate finance at Debswana at a senior management level. Nassim has also served as a board member in the Debswana Pension Fund, the Botswana Accountancy College and the Pula Medical Aid. She's currently serving as a director of the First National Bank in Botswana, declared the, currently the leading bank in the ratings and the rankings. Ms. Lari has also served in a variety of other positions, but is someone I know best for her passion on the ground with a variety of projects in communities in which Lukara operates. Nassim is also a proud and accomplished African who's led so much of the inputs into the work that's being done at a Canadian level around responsible mining and best practice that truly, I believe, exemplifies Canada-Africa collabora Canada collaboration at its finest. Nassim, if I may just add one more point as a key supporter of the chamber, I also thank you for being headline sponsor through Lucara of our upcoming three-day summit in Toronto, Africa Accelerating, which will also be broadcast all over the world and live um, across Africa and across Canada with viewing parties in different African cities. More on that a little bit later. Nassim Lari, pleasure to welcome you to the panel and over to you. Thank you so much, Gareth. Um, I'm actually blushing right now. I don't think you can see that. But <laughs> and then again, I'm worried about the fact that people are doing the maths and trying to figure out how old I am. So there's a lot of decade in there, right? <laughs> but anyways, thank you so much uh, for inviting me to this panel. And it's such an honor to be on the panel. And um, just to, 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 to touch back on, on what Ben was talking about, we've actually started through the Botswana Chamber of Mines actually subscribing to, to TSM. So hopefully in my next presentations that we go along with, I'll be showing some great stats on, on Lucana Botswana. So <laughs> heads up to you there, Ben. Anyways, I'm gonna try and get my presentation on now. And um, again, I'd like to thank all the, the viewers of, 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 of this particular conference. It's uh, like we're saying, we, we, we're actually getting a lot of traction virtually, which is great, right? Because we could never get about 200 people in a span of three weeks, right? So it's quite amazing to have that available. And uh, in this new normal, it's pretty great, right? So just to introduce you to who Lukara Botswana is and um, what we do. Lukara Botswana actually owns a mine called Karua Diamond Mine in the northwest uh, of Botswana in a village called Letlakani. We are 100% owned by a Canadian company called Lukara Diamonds. So 100% Canadian. And the unique thing about this particular company is that uh, in 2013, actually 2012, we, were, um, we started production 
And we're the only mine, diamond mine in Botswana that is privately owned. And at that time, um, we were a small fish in a big ocean, but now we've expanded in size in terms of the production levels that we have. And uh, I'll tell you why. Our production levels sit at about 200, let's call it 400,000 carats, compared to um, a company called Debswana, which is government owned in partnership with De Beers. They produce about, let's say, I won't talk about the COVID issues that we're experiencing right now on, on the Botswana side, but they produce about, let's call it 20 million uh, um, carats. So if you look at our carriage, which is 400,000 carats per annum versus 20 million, we were a small fish in the ocean in Botswana and a privately owned company. But because of the way we do things at Lukara Botswana and through the Canadian influence as well, technology and a whole host of things were brought on board. And we are now the foremost producer of large diamonds in the world. So we are known for all the large production that comes through in the world. So in as much as we're the smaller mining company that produces 400,000 carats, we have a big impact on the industry. So just in terms of uh, um, Lukara Botswana and Tarue Diamond Mine, we are an open pit mine at the moment running up to 2026 and hopefully going into an underground um, mine at 2036 again. Um, that is very unusual for diamond mines to go under, underground. And we believe that through the expertise that we are employing, we will have a successful underground mine coming up soon. And like I said, we are a very innovative operation. We have brought on the first technology in the world in the extraction of diamonds. And it has led to us actually recovering historic diamonds. And I always say, you know, I work in this company and I make history every day. So it'll, uh, I'll bring on the pictures just now. You'll see what history we make. But it's because of the fact that the organization that we work for is not afraid of uh, technology. And we, we, we are not risk averse. We, we are a small organization, but we make decisions very quickly and we, we make the right decisions. And again, we're not risk averse, right? Um, one of the key things that I'd, I'd want to mention at this point here is we actually, um, as Karoe Diamond Mine, it's, it's a very unique mine specifically because we actually mine a, a diamond called type 2A diamonds, which is actually 1% to 2% of the world's population of diamonds. So we have a very, very unique product. And I think that's the reason we've made a mark in, 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 in the world, actually. I wouldn't say Botswana specifically. Even though Botswana is known for its diamond, we've made a bigger mark on, on the fact that we have unique diamonds. So as I take you to the next slide, I, I keep saying we make history every day. So we have recovered uh, actually the largest, um, I'm going to say the second largest uh, diamond recovered through a processing plant. And this is the Lisseri Laruna being 1,109 carats. You'll see that it's, it's labeled second largest gem recovered. The first uh, uh, largest gem was the Cullinan, but that was actually picked up off the ground. So if I were to categorize my slide right now, I would say it's the first. But in saying that, when I get to my next slide, you'll see that we've recovered the, the largest stone again, which is basically in, in 2019. So we're really making history here. But just to, to show you the context of, of the Lisseri, um, um, I know Ben showed you his carpet. I'm going to try and show you what the Lisseri looks like in terms of a replica. So that is the Lisseri right now in replica. It's not the real one because I would be uh, with my security officials if, if I had the real Lisseri. But this is the Lisseri Larona, which was bought by, by Graf. And effectively uh, the largest, at that time, the, the, the largest stone to ever be recovered. We, in, in conjunction with the Lisseri, we recovered a, a stone called the Constellation, an 813 carat diamond. Um, which was sold at 63.1 million US dollars. And this is the largest price ever fetched in the world for um, a luxury good. So again, you know, historic, we've got historical prices coming through and recoveries. Recently, like just last year, we recovered the Suelo. And you can see if I lift the, the Lisseri, how clear it is. The Suelo actually is 1,758 carats. It has a sort of darkish tone around it but it is a very, very unique stone because as you put the light through, if you, can, if you observe on the, on the presentation, there's a bit of light coming through. It's actually a very, when, when, I, when I look at this, I actually see Christ, specifically because when I get into churches, for, for those who have been in a church, you see Christ with the light in the background. And that's exactly what it, it, it's so, it's so biblical. So in any case, aside from going back to God and Christ, it's, it's an amazing stone. It's very, very unique. And um, 
we have currently gone into a partnership and it's one of, uh, one of a kind in the world with Louis Vuitton, who are actually showcasing the stone right now as we speak. So we have actually showcased Botswana with the highest luxury brand in the world as well. So this is, I'm giving you a bit of context to where I'm going in terms of what Lukara Botswana is and what it means to Botswana because Botswana is, is a diamond producing country. The biggest and, and largest um, value in terms of exports is generated from diamond mining and, and the diamond revenue. So again, just to point out the last sort of sentence at the, at the bottom is, we are the only operation in the world to recover two stones in excess of a thousand carats. And we're still making history. In 2020, we recovered a 549 carat uh, diamond recovered through um, a machine called um, the Mega Diamond Recovery or XRT machine. And again, the XRT machinery was brought onto our site for the first time in the diamond industry. So there's a lot of first time and first implementations that you see coming through. And it's, it's brought Botswana, Botswana has always been on the map for diamonds, but it's, it's brought Botswana on another level on the map for diamonds, specifically in, in relation to technology. Um, I've touched on this already, but a lot of the things that, are, that we use to extract our diamonds actually assist us to get the large diamonds. We've had the first inst installation in Africa of an autogenous mill for diamond extraction. It has never been used, well, when we went into, into mining, it, was never been it had never been used in Africa for diamond liberation. We started using it. The first installation in the world of the XRT machines was done at our operation. And the XRT machines were actually used in food production or food sorting actually, where they were used to sort um, a bad fruit from a, a good fruit. So we then looked at it and thought it would be a great idea if we use this technology to, to actually implement in diamond recovery. And the company that we, we approached, the German company called Tomra, they're very excited about this and we were their first pilot. And it's yielded, um, if you looked at the, the, the pricing that we had uh, on the constellation, just one stone paid for the capital injection on, on, on the XRT machines that we put in. Um, and again, we have a very unique processing unit. We do not crush our diamonds. We liberate them as, as, as intact as possible. So that's how we achieve that. But in doing that, um, actually, I'm going to pause here. We, we are a very responsible mine, and we, we, we mine responsibly but sustainably. And our communities are very key to the production of our diamonds. So the word karoe is called precious, is, is actually translated in, 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 in a language in Botswana, and it's translated as precious stone. That name was chosen by the community. So when we opened up our operation, the community assisted us to open up the operation. They named our operation. If you look at the name Liseri Laruna, it was, the stone was actually named by the country. We had a competition that we ran and the country actually named that stone. So whatever we do, we, we make sure that we, we, we engage the communities on a sustainable basis. Our, our current complement at the operation or strength is 1,200 people on site. 98% of the employees on our site are citizens of Botswana. This is the largest, I mean, the largest proportion of citizens employed in Botswana, where we have 98% of Botswana employed at our operation. It's the highest statistic we have. Normally it ranges from about, let's call it 85% to, to, to 90. It's never this high. Again, coming back to something that, that Ben talked about is um, procurement. 80% of our procurement is done locally. The reason we have the differential on 20% is specifically because we are using German expertise for our XRTs, which we have this year brought internally. So hopefully by next year, we'll be looking at a number of 90 to 95%. So the communities benefit from employment in our area as well as procurement. In addition to that, I mean, that is given. In any operation that you run, the communities benefit through employment and also through, through the procurement activities. But what we wanted to do is think beyond um, the mining operations. As you saw, I talk about a 10-year life open pit and then maybe another 10-year underground. But that does not sustain the operations that we have, I mean, the communities that we live in or the communities of interest specifically because it doesn't sustain them beyond those 10 years. So what we have done in relation to our community projects is we brought in inexpensive or inexpensive investments that have high impact and are sustainable for the community. So it's giving them diversity in terms of 
the um, what they can get into. So it's not only about mining. We are diversifying the villages that we, we operate in. And if, if you can see the slide, it, it, it says that we, we have 19 villages that we support. And all these 19 villages, we do not want them to be completely dependent on mining, specifically because if the mining goes, then they left basically destitute. And we don't want that to happen because that's not, and I know at the beginning of, of, of the presentation, Susan uh, sort of talked about the word sustainability and sort of scrapped it. We believe in the word sustainability because it is only if we can do things sustainability in our project, I mean, sustainably in our projects, we can actually leverage of diversity as well and not just look at mining and look at other areas. And for us right now, and I think everyone in the world, we had identified food security as part of our diversity in terms of the community. And you can see right now, we have contributed quite a bit in terms of the COVID-19 impact. Botswana is so dependent on South Africa for its food production. We have a project called um, the Mukubilo Integrated Farm, which I've listed here as our, our flagship project. It's an integrated farm where we were producing food. And to be honest with you, the 19 villages that we support were actually being provided food by a community that we had empowered to produce food for that region. And from a dependency perspective, we actually reduced that dependency in the area that we operate in because of the integrated farm. So I talk about our flagship projects. The key projects that we talk about, and it's not the only projects that we have, but I would like to talk about them specifically because they have brought a lot of a big impact to the communities that we work in. And the, the one is the Mukubilo Integrated Farm that I'm talking about and the Latakani Abattoir. So in as much as we are producing large stones and large, you know, we, we, we investing in, in, in innovation in our mining, we have done exactly the same to the, op, uh, the communities that we operate in. And the Mukubilo Integrated Farm, you will see there's beetroot here. The reason that we had chosen Mukubilo, which is the, the area that uh, the farm is in, is because it was the poorest region in the area that we were operating in. And they had a high level of malnutrition there. So what we have done with this farm is we have employed seven people who didn't have a job. And the re we've employed these seven individuals specifically because um, we want to train them. We don't want to retain them. We want to train them to own their own farms, to add back to food security in Botswana. So we actually train and release in terms of the employees that, uh, that work within our operations, or should I say at the integrated farm. The farm is actually owned by the community. So all the income that comes in goes straight back to the community and they can own shares in this particular farm. So it's empowering the community where, and the numbers are, are small, but for the community that we're in, it's really big because it was the, 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 the poorest community in the, in, the areas we were, in the area that we're working in. So two days from January, um, the farm has actually earned a half a million pula, which is equivalent to about 50,000 US dollars. And this amount here gets reinvested in the farm. This farm is doing so well that we've actually gone into a phase two. And the initial capital investment, again, it was not very large, but it had a high impact. So we invested about 1.5 million pula, call it um, 100,000 US dollars. And we are now empowering a community. They're producing their own rape uh, crop, which is very similar to spinach. Um, and this, I mean, it, we've got dry land farming there. We've got mealies coming through. And this is my favorite picture. And the reason that I, it, it's my favorite picture, it's just to any layman out there, it's a picture of eggs. This community never had the pleasure of eating an egg, ever. With the farm that we have provided or, or funded, the community is spoiled for choice now. They have green vegetables and they have eggs for, I would say for Africa, but uh, it's probably just for the region. But they have enough eggs that what has happened, we have reduced the malnutrition index to almost zero in that area, where it was the highest in, in the region. So these eggs have contributed to um, a community that is earning, that is employed, and is also now serving the country in terms of food security. So that for me, in terms of just this picture here, this picture is, is, is so close to my heart because now when we go to that farm, we are considered the diamond miners, but not the, these diamonds. We are mining green diamonds and we're mining eggs. 
And what we're looking at is hopefully by the end of this year, we'll have a second phase. And we're quite spoiled for choice with this community in the sense that they do not have enough supply for the demand out there, which is a great position to be in. We initially started off very skeptical, but right now it's the first of its kind in Botswana. And we are now taking this idea to the rest of Botswana, firstly, obviously, to the areas that we operate in and then to the bigger Botswana. Nassim, thank you very much. I know, I know this is one of so many projects that you've got going. We've got a number of questions coming in. Would you mind if okay. we came back to this toward the, toward the end? Um, no because problem. That's really fantastic. Congratulations, not only diversifying the supply chain within the mining operations, but creating entirely new markets that are going to be sustained uh, across Botswana. Um, really, really impressive. Nassim Lari, thank you very much. We'll come back. Please keep questions coming in either on the WhatsApp line uh, or, of course, you can ask them right here on the platform. Our next speaker is Jamie Webb, uh, Chief Operations Officer and Director of International Programs at Sturdy. Prior to joining Sturdy, Ms. Webb worked as the Regional Manager for the Asia Pacific at the UN Climate Convention's Climate Technology Center and Network. Ms. Webb brings 20 years of experience with the UN where she served as head of their Environmental Education Unit, which is the global coordinator for forest-based climate change mitigation. She's also served with, on sustainability, working with the World Bank, looking at the links between land management and climate change. And as you can see, this is an entirely broad range of areas. How does it tie into natural resources? Well, Jamie's with us today to share exactly that. Uh, Jamie, thank you for joining us. It's your first time at the Canada-Africa Chamber of Business. We're delighted to host you. Thank you very much, um, and it's a pleasure to, to be here uh, with this group. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm not my, myself an extractives expert, so I was very happy to hear in particular Ben talk about climate and clean energy and biodiversity, because that is my, my area of expertise and is close to my heart. Uh, but I would like to begin this presentation by acknowledging that the land on which Surdi is hosted is the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil nations. And I also just want to give you a little bit of background as to why I selected gender as, as the focus of the presentation today. Um, and it really is because of what CERTI has realized in terms of how we need to approach gender and natural resource governance, which is in both continents. Um, we acknowledge the fact that capacity building can't just happen in our partner communities. It also has to happen within CERTI and within our Canadian partners that we're working with. Um, so today I am going to be introducing, sorry, I'm not sure why I'm not advancing. There we go. Um, I will be introducing uh, both aspects of CERTI's work, uh, our institutional gender strategy, as well as our work with our partners in Ethiopia. But I want to start by just talking about why it is that we're looking at gender. Uh, the first reason is because it is aligned with our values and our approach. Um, we do work on extractives, but we also work more broadly on pu public sector capacity and governance, as well as environment and climate change. Uh, but all of that is housed within the framework of inclusive growth and community engagement, of which gender is a critical component. Uh, but it's more than just that. For us, gender isn't just about a moral or ethical responsibility. It's also about ensuring the sustainability of the investments that we're making and that our government partners are making. And it's about economic empowerment. When we're developing communities, we can't be developing one portion of the community. Um, the sustainable development goals talk about leaving no one behind and reaching the furthest first. And so often in mining communities, that is women and youth. Um, so we did develop our gender e equality strategy internally uh, for CERTI. Um, it talks about the vision, our vision of how sustainable natural resource development can and should be generating lasting and inclusive benefits. Uh, it was developed in response to the Government of Canada's launching of FIAC, the Feminist International Assistance Policy, uh, and our recognition that this was the way forward in development, not just in terms of funding from Canada, but in terms of the standards that our partners in Canada, as well as in developing countries, were setting in terms of the investments that they wanted to see. Uh, we developed it through a consultation with over 100 stakeholders. Uh, across the spectrum in order to ensure that we were capturing multiple perspectives in our work and that we were responsive both to the needs of the Canadian suppliers of support as well as the recipients in developing countries. And it really does serve as our own internal guidance document um, to support all our work in every single project that we implement. 
we really focus on three strategic intervention points and I encourage others to also take these on board in their work. Um, the first is about leadership and representation. This is building the capacity of women to participate, but also ensuring that they're given the opportunities to participate, um, that they're engaged in the consultation. The second is about uh, training. Uh, and training and capacity building. Uh, and here it really is important not to go into situations with preconceived notions. Uh, one of my favorite examples from our work is a capacity building program that we implemented with artisanal small scale miners in uh, Ecuador actually. And we included in this, this group hancheras, which are women miners who recover, they, they're, they're called gold pickers because they pick up um, whatever nobody else can, can make a profit off of. So it's very, very low returns, very high labor intensive. Uh, and we went in and we thought, you know, we'll, we'll provide them with training. And in the initial consultation, we said, you know, what do you want training in? You know, health and safety, making more profit, building business plans. And what came out is the fact that these hunters, they actually by and large hated their jobs. They didn't want to be doing this. They just didn't have an opportunity. And they said, you know what, can you train us in how to be beauticians? And so there we were implementing with the, the Ministry of Mines in, in Ecuador, this massive training program on artisanal small scale mining, um, having to source beautician trainers for these women. But it did illustrate for us the fact that you can't go in with preconceived notions. You need to listen to the women in the communities that you're working with and understand what it is that they want to achieve for themselves and for their families. And the final strategic intervention point is around gender competency uh, within public sectors. So this is talking about both individuals, but also institutions. Uh, are there the working groups to support the integration? Is there the intersectoral discussions between ministries? Um, are the right uh, indicators being included in ministry plans and strategies to ensure that the public sector uh, governance, uh, gender outcomes are improved? We have now, after almost a year, have had a look at where we've uh, succeeded in terms of operationalizing the strategy internally. Um, I'm not going to go through all of this, but the purpose of this is just to give you an idea of the types of things that we're measuring internally. Uh, what it is that we want to achieve in order to ensure that as staff, um, as implementers of projects, many of which are funded by the Government of Canada, we're fulfilling our responsibility to, to FIAP and to gender outcomes. I'm now going to go into a specific project, which is our a flagship project, the Supporting Ministry of Mines project in Ethiopia. Um, it's a $15 million project funded by Global Affairs Canada. We're, we just received a no-cost extension, so the implementation period will be extended until June 2022. Uh, this project is really incredibly unique in that it is a longer term investment in the capacity of the Ministry of Mines and Petroleum and the Geological Survey of Ethiopia. And our staff and team is embedded within the Ministry in Ethiopia. Uh, this is not your traditional technical assistance project. It has been co-designed right from the very beginning uh, in close partnership with, with the Ministry and our other partners in Ethiopia. What it really focuses on is um, comprehensive reform within the ministry and changes at the individual, organizational, and at the institutional levels, both centrally and within the regions. Uh, the SUM project, even though it was established before FIAP came into force, has fully embraced FIAP and the uh, responsibility and opportunity to strengthen gender outcomes. Uh, it is supporting the integration of gender, not just in the implementation of the activities under the SUM project, but more broadly across the ministry and all of the directorates. It began with a gender-based review and analysis, which was done collectively with the ministry, uh, and really looked at what this current status was, uh, where there were good practices to be drawn from the ministry's existing programs, and where global leading practices could be brought in to strengthen the ministry's approach. What's important to note here is that the ministry is incredibly open and supportive of this work, and they put a very high priority of it, and that is a critical precondition to success. Uh, the mineral sector in Ethiopia is rapidly expanding. Um, it's entering a new phase of foreign investment and growth, uh, and we're very, very happy to see that through the work of the SUM project, um, and as it continues on, gender is becoming the new norm in this development process. 
Um, but what did we actually do? It's all well and good to talk about what we achieved, but how did we get there? The first was establishing a gender equality working group within the ministry. Um, and this was the group that actually conducted the gender capacity assessment and identified some of the critical needs in terms of internal training and, um, in, and institutional reforms. We held the first training in September last year uh, and it was incredibly successful. Um, in delivering that training, we also ensured that the working group was equipped with the capacity to deliver subsequent trainings. So to ensure the sustainability of the investment. We also supported the working group in developing a, a number of documents that were required to, to guide future work, a gender equality strategy for the ministry, gender mainstreaming guidelines, and out of this training, the gender training manual. And this is really important that we don't want to come in and deliver one set of activities and then um, build a reliance. We really look at ensuring that our partners in country are able to take the work forward and expand it. Uh, in terms of what's next, uh, we have, as a result of COVID, identified a number of areas where we really want to see further investment. Um, the first is understanding and, and filling data gaps. Uh, what we've noticed is that we have a lot of information on women minors and um, their participation in the sector, and we have a lot of information on health and social development, but we don't often have that information consolidated. Um, and we need to, to look at how we can support that data management across institutions and ministries. Uh, the second is to really help support investments in women-run enterprises and natural resource. Uh, this sector is falling far behind uh, women's enterprise investments compared to other sectors like agriculture and we want to put a particular focus on filling that gap and accelerating bringing natural resource uh, women's run enterprises to the same level of investment and attention as, as agriculture and, um, and, and biodiversity and climate. And finally we want to see an acceleration in training on gender issues both in Canada and within our community partners in Africa. Uh, and this is really what, what we've discovered here within, within COVID is that we're actually seeing a new opportunity to improve capacity building and training. Um, the old model of sending an expert into a community, providing training for a week and then disappearing can't work under COVID. We need to look at different methods and models for delivering training and capacity building. Um, CERTI is based at the University of British Columbia, which means we have access to all of UBC's distance learning expertise, tools and resources. And that's allowed us to really leap ahead in terms of understanding how, deliver, how to deliver training on gender and gender issues in a way that is equitable, that's responsive to the needs of communities, and that doesn't result in, in greater inequalities because of lack of access to technologies or the inability to engage in some of the social learning aspects. Um, so I, I will leave it there. Um, and once again, thank all of the participants and the organizers for giving us the opportunity to discuss this very important issue. Jamie Webb, thank you so much and congratulations on the great efforts. And thank you too to Global Affairs Certainly as a chamber, we know what it means to have partnership with uh, Global Affairs Canada and the excellent support and the leadership there of Susan Stefan, among others. Uh, well, we're going into our Q&A, but we've got our penultimate speaker and then we, of course, wrap up uh, the panel with Wayne Floriani. Our next speaker that's with us uh, joins us from, the, from MSTA, or the Mining Suppliers Trade Association here of Canada, Trade Association, Ryan McEachran is responsible for the administration, the member services, and all government relations at MSDA. He comes to the panel today with over 20 years of experience working both in Canada, across Africa, and globally in the mining industry for both multinational mining companies, investment banks, and on global manufacturing and other services firms. Ryan holds an MBA from Wilfrid Laurier University, and he's also a professional geologist in the province of Ontario. Ryan, welcome. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to join this uh, panel and uh, give a chance to uh, hopefully share uh, some interesting um, uh, stories of what the supply chain is doing in terms of uh, what we would call leaders uh, within developing natural resources. So um, I will uh, start uh, my screen here. Let's, uh, let's go there. 
And uh, I was kind of here, but um, I'm just gonna jump right to, to that. Uh, this is just uh, a very high level explanation of our association. Uh, next year, we'll be celebrating 40 years as an association, so we're pretty proud of that. Um, and uh, with re respect to uh, Jamie's presentation, I'm uh, quite pleased to, to share that um, our board of directors are, is uh, gender neutral, uh, is half women and half men. And uh, we certainly see the benefits of the diversity of thought and experience as a result of that. So um, I am uh, very pleased to share that. Um, I just want to give, uh, yeah, I, I have three very short examples of companies that are actively in, uh, in uh, Africa, working in Africa, and uh, by no means, uh, it's a, it's a, I could have a much longer list, uh, which is uh, exciting, but I just wanted to highlight uh, three that uh, I thought would fit, uh, and I think it does fit some of the dialogue I've been hearing uh, so far, um, uh, in particular, uh, uh, we talked about at the very beginning, I believe, Susan, you had mentioned, you know, the reduction of carbon emissions and, and water use and, and, and overall quality of the environment. And, and the, I think these examples will share that. And so the first one I have here is McLean Engineering, um, a company based of a small town called Collingwood, uh, Ontario, uh, has been close to being around for 50 years. Um, they started in Africa in the 90s but have in recent uh, years uh, have increased and expanded their, uh, their, their presence there. Uh, they have a, a, a big office, a thousand square meter uh, facility, manufacturing facility, I should say, in uh, South Africa right now, uh, which is helping them grow their footprint uh, in, in the uh, African market. And what I wanted to highlight from this company, of course, is uh, very early on, uh, in the mining industry in terms of battery electric vehicles, that's what BVS is. Um, they, they were one of the first movers at this in 2015 in terms of commercializing uh, product lines that could be used underground uh, with uh, battery electric vehicles. So uh, a clever uh, spin on it, leading the charge, uh, is, is a bit of a tagline for them. But you know, this is a good example of how we're uh, improving the work environment underground for, for people, for the workers there, uh, just by the removal of emissions. Um, so it's a, it's a healthier, it's a noise reduction, it's a, it's a much quieter uh, piece of equipment. And as a result of that, you're actually reducing costs from the company because your, your needs for ventilation of clean air actually starts to get reduced. So these are just, you know, and, and the overall reduction of your GHG footprint. So it's a good example of what Canada is bringing uh, to the world in general. But here's a company that's in Africa and has a, you know, a lot of experience. And in, in, as I show there, there's over 40,000 uh, operating hours already uh, with their equipment line. So they truly are leaders in this technology. I'll move to the next one. So this, uh, this is another company active in, in uh, Africa. They are a publicly traded firm, so I have to be uh, 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 respectful of their uh, confidentiality with some of their business. But um, what I can share with you is one example. They have two products, and this one's called the Glass Lock Process. And what this does is uh, a lot of times in, in, uh, in, in processing ores uh, from, from uh, the earth, uh, there's some uh, toxic elements that will come with them. And one of them is arsenic. Uh, and there are complex uh, ores that come out. And, and what they have been able to do is uh, historically companies have either bypassed those types of ores or the, uh, they're, they're sitting there in a, a toxic level uh, historically uh, after the processing. What they've been able to do though is encapsulate the arsenic at a high percentage, up to 20%, which is a very concentrated level, in a, a vitrified or what we would call glass. So if you look, as you can see uh, to the left moving right, there is uh, the actual, uh, they actually have this process now at a smelter in Africa. And you can see it actually, the glass product being poured that's encapsulating 
the arsenic. And there you have the final product, that big black, uh, hat, that's a fairly large piece and it's actually on their desk in their office. And you might be asking, why uh, does Ryan have a, a picture of an aquarium? Well, if you look closely at the bottom, that is crushed up uh, glass with the arsenic in it to show you how stable this, has, this technology stabilizes the arsenic. So it's not poisonous or toxic to the environment uh, at all. And uh, they, they keep that aquarium in their office, in the front office when you go into, uh, they're based out of uh, uh, just outside Montreal, Quebec. So it's a, it's, I, I'm uh, very pleased to kind of share a type of a company that's bringing what I call uh, green or clean tech solutions to the industry and they're active in Africa. The other, the other process they do have also is called the Clever process and it actually removes cyanide from the gold, uh, the gold processing uh, uh, process. So uh, again, another uh, stellar process that I think will be gaining more traction as we look for ways to do this in a lot more safer manner. The last one here I wanted to share with you is a company called Cypher Environmental. Um, you know, they've, they've recently rebranded re, uh, re and they've come up with a tagline called always do what's right. And I'll explain a little bit about that, uh, what they're doing with that corporately. But they have these two products, one, and they're both environmentally friendly. They're not toxic to the environment. And they remove uh, either the dust component, which is a huge issue in a lot of countries in Africa, especially during the dry seasons. And it also stabilizes the roads and actually works just as well as, as uh, pavement. And what you see here is an example, this bauxite mine in Guinea, uh, Africa, there are over 5,000 trucks, they estimate, that travel on that road every day. And as you can see on the right, it's not just the, it's not just the operating trucks, it's, it's uh, the, the local communities that are there. And so this product has also removed the dust and so they improved the air quality of it. It's made the conditions safer during rainy season and during the dry season. And it, it has just improved the living standards of the communities around there. Now, one of the things that I'll just add to this company is they're really taking what we would call ESG, it's been called CSR, uh, Corporate Social Responsibility or Environment uh, uh, Social and Governance, and they're taking it to heart and that always do what's right. So what they've started doing now is they will share two to 5% of the revenues at a project and, and donate product to the communities in that area. And they just recently did it in Canada, up in Baffin Island to a, a community that's very far north to deal with their dust issues in, in the summertime. And that was a result of a business relationship they have with a company called Baffinland Iron Ore. They are doing this around the world now, and they also take 10 to 20% of their profits, or 10 to 12% of their profits, and they donate that to local charities in their, in their local communities as well at home. So I think this is, a, this is definitely a great example of, of Canadian uh, supplier going beyond what they would uh, help execute a, a, a company's uh, CSR or ESG uh, strategy, but they're adding and building off of it as a result of their benefits and their way of giving back to the communities. So again, that was just three examples of some of the Canadian suppliers out there that are doing a wonderful job. I just might add to, ben, to build off of one of Ben's comments about local supply chain. Over 80 or at least 90% of the companies that I deal with as members of ours around, that do business around the world require and actively seek out local hiring of, of, of employees. Having what we call boots on the ground is, is not a barrier to trade, it's a necessity. They actually need that. So um, I, it, you know, when it comes to employment opportunities out of mine, the supply chain can actually be a much larger multiplier in terms of employment opportunities. And as I said, the Canadians mining suppliers actively look for that in, in building capacity in, in that workforce and, and then deploying them as well. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much uh, for that excellent presentation, Ryan, and for those three case studies. And in fact, uh, Mine Africa, 
uh, our next panelist, Wayne Floriani, founding partner there, had featured uh, uh, one of the, the last company during a recent panel they had with one of the top universities here in Canada with Schulich Business School. Uh, Wayne Floriani leading us now uh, into the panel discussion, who's going to be addressing the broader macro picture around mining finance. We know Canada is a leader when it comes to mining finance across the continent. The sheer numbers tell a story, but even more important are some of these examples on how that financing helps specific companies and specific communities, companies, and the creation of new supply chains. Wayne Floriani is uh, not only with Mine Africa, but he's also served for many years as a board member here at the Canada Africa Chamber of Business. He set up Mine Africa together with past president Bruce Shapiro, who joins us on the call today as well, who led the chamber for 22 years before I took over last year. Uh, through working with the chamber, Mine Africa, in fact, was the first organization to promote CSR back in 2006, working with Hatch, running 17 seminars internationally on the subject area. So certainly we're ahead of the curve and hosting the biggest mining breakfast in the Americas, focused on African mining annually, which is done in partnership with the Chamber. Uh, and Mine Africa is focusing on being the leading platform for African mining suppliers, working with service providers and governments. To hear from the trends and on the big numbers, Wayne Floriani. Thank you, Gareth, and thank you, Susan. I'm delighted to be here today. Um, half of the global mining companies, so half of the publicly traded mining companies in the world are listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange and the TSX Venture Exchange. So that number, I think, says uh, pretty much everything that I have to say today about Canada's importance in terms of a uh, equity financing um, source for the global mining industry. Toronto Stock Exchange is the main exchange, the uh, Venture Exchange is the junior exchange, and uh, together that comprises the TSX. There are approximately uh, 3,300 companies listed on those two, two exchanges in Toronto. Out of the 3,300, 1,130 are mining companies. So I'm going to repeat that. One in, three, one in three companies listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange and the TSX Venture Exchange are mining companies. That's how important Canada is as a world centre for mining finance. Obviously, with that number of mining companies uh, listed here in Toronto, you have to have a huge support mechanism uh, around that. We have associations such as we've heard from today, MSTA, uh, Mining Association of Canada. We have R&D institutes across our educational institutions in Canada. We have uh, law firms and financial services providers, over 200 mining analysts um, in Canada. All the big law firms have global mining practices based out of Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver. We have um, service supply sector, um, engineering and geological expertise. All of that supports the global exploration, financing and mining development side and production around mining. A little bit of background in terms of the financing. In the last five years, um, going up to this is uh, data current to 2019, the end of it, 53% um, of all mining equity financings were done on the TSX and TSX Venture Exchange more than half of the world's financings. Those financing raised about 37% of the total money raised for mining in uh, that same five-year period. I don't have to talk about Africa. Is Africa's importance in a, it's a mining destination. It's got half of the world's global uh, gold reserves, 90% uh, 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 platinum cobalt, most of 35% uh, of uranium, uh, coltan, 75%, which goes into cell phone batteries, uh, two-thirds of manganese, silver, diamonds, we could go on. Um, anyhow, it's, it's dramatically uh, significant what Africa has. You couple that with Canada's uh, capacity for financing projects, and it's no doubt that, no surprise, that Canadian companies and TSX listed companies are so active in Africa. Out of the um, uh, total mining companies listed on the TSX, about 1,300, 10% or about 105 are active in Africa. They're active in 35 countries in Africa and they have about 350 projects on the go in Africa. Let me just show you a quick slide uh, on the distribution of that. Bear with me for one moment. And uh, Wayne, could you, I just wanted to check, it doesn't appear that uh, you're sharing screen yet. Oh, you're on, that's perfect, thank you. Okay. Perfect.
what you're seeing here is a uh, geographic spread for all of the TSX and TSX Venture listed companies and where they're operating. Of course, Canada and North America uh, figure prominently in there, Latin America and South America uh, certainly as well. But you can see Africa with 34 companies from the TSX, the main board, and 71 from uh, the Venture Exchange, the Junior Exchange. Here's where they're operating in Africa. Uh, as I mentioned, about 350 projects, 105 companies. Western Africa figures prominently with Burkina Faso, Mali um, leading the way, Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire. And then Namibia, you look down at Southern Africa, you'll see Namibia, Botswana, South Africa also quite, quite um, dramatic. One other slide I'd like to bring up here for you. Um, again, I'd mentioned, so um, the Toronto Stock Exchange is number one in listed mining companies globally, number one in mining equity raised. The bottom uh, left quarter of this shows you how significant we are as a global uh, player vis-a-vis -vis the Australian Securities uh, Commission. So we've got about 1,200 uh, companies on mining companies. They've got 675. That third chart is 157. That's the London Stock Exchange and the alternative uh, exchange, the junior exchange in London. So Canada um, dwarfs the other exchanges in terms of uh, listings and activity. I'd like to thank Dean McPherson from the Toronto Stock Exchange. Dean is the head of uh, business development for the global mining industry, and he supplied me with those charts. A quick update on, I think, some, what's going on. COVID obviously is a huge news right now. What has that done in terms of new listings? And it's been surprisingly very little from the mining space. Uh, the number of new listings in uh, 2000 and 2020 for the first six months, so to June of this year, there were eight, 16 new mining listings on the TSX um, on the exchanges versus uh, 11 last year. So it's actually improved uh, the number of new listings on the exchanges this year. Um, a couple of other news items I think that are significant is there's been a massive um, capital injection and funding due to COVID from uh, governments in supporting. And I think that's going to cause, you know, an increase in commodity pricing, which bodes well for Canada and for Africa. Um, Warren Buffett's uh, her, uh, Berkshire Hathaway just invested in Barrick Gold for the first time ever in a mining company. They spent almost uh, $550 million in buying uh, 21 million shares of Barrick, who's very active in Africa. That I think is a very, uh, very significant confidence builder for um, Africa, for mining in general, Canada and Africa. And um, I think the other factor we have to talk about a little bit is uh, China. You can't talk about mining, you can't talk about Africa without mentioning China. There are significant players investing over 300 billion in the last 15 years there, or somewhere around that number in uh, infrastructure, mining. But there are big players in there um, and we have to be aware of that. And that's pretty much everything I think. Try to get us done, done at 12.20 uh, here, and I'm certainly happy to answer any questions. And it was a pleasure talking to you today. For more information on what we do at Mine Africa, please uh, check out our website, mineafrica.com. Thanks, Gareth. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Wayne. And just incredible, the numbers are a reminder that the Canada-Africa partnership when it comes to natural resources is not just an opportunity, it's an actuality and an enormous amount has been done, but of course a lot more can be done, especially in this area and discussion that we're getting into now around how this natural resource investment triggers the creation of new markets and accelerates the process of broad-based and inclusive growth across the continent, taking into account all of the areas that were covered today, gender, uh, community empowerment, direct shareholding by communities and members of communities in various operations. I'm going to get to the questions as swiftly as possible. And I'm going to start, if I may, in the order of three questions. Nassim Lari, first one goes to you. Given that you're focused as a mining company, how did you as a chief executive persuade your board to invest and focus not just on a CSI level in other community projects, but actually make a business case in an African market. Um, any comments you have or experiences around that? The second question goes to Ryan. Have you seen other, have you seen Canadian service providers serving the mining industry able to pivot and also provide some of their services to other areas of opportunity 
sectors where Canada is not as largely invested or is not a world leader, or shall we say not yet a world leader, into so other sectors where you're seeing Canadian service providers pivot. Any thoughts on that? And then, Jamie, a question to you, given your background uh, coming from outside of natural resources, what struck you the most when it comes to the issue of gender empowerment? Um, the, and the question is specifically, what is the biggest area of focus that you think Canadian companies should look at when it comes to ensuring gender parity and gender equality? And if I can start in that order, Nassim, over to you. Okay, thank you. I think um, the business case specifically in relation to diamonds in Botswana is, is quite a strong one. So I think it wasn't a very difficult business case to talk to, specifically looking at what I had discussed earlier on in my presentation, that the operation that it was actually a De Beers asset previously, and it was too small for them to actually absorb because of the, the characters that I spoke about. But little did they know that we'd be making the, these big marks in, 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 <laughs> in the world. But I think at the time, it was, it was a very easy discussion, specifically because Botswana is known for their diamonds, and the return on investment also was almost immediate with the diamonds. And the diamond industry in terms of just the profit line is, is very key because we, we I mean, 60%, uh, you have a 60% gross profit margin, right? So on that basis alone, there was a clear indication of a return on investment. And the country itself, just in relation to, 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 to the government, it was a very easy discussion also from government because we are in diamonds, and the country actually is looking for, for private investors to come on board. And that's why you heard me mentioning that we are the only company right now in Diamonds that is privately owned. And it's because of the, the infrastructure that we have and the relationships that we have with government. So it made it very easy to get an, a private investor in. And again, on the business case side, it was a given because it's an asset that is very unique. And again, it's, as you can see, it's producing one of the largest stones in the world. So I, I think, um, it's uh, an easy subject to talk about, specifically because it's diamonds in Botswana. Fantastic, thanks very much, Nassim. Uh, Ryan, next question to you. Yeah, so uh, in terms of pivoting, um, that's a common word that's tied to COVID, so I'm not sure if that's where you're heading. But, uh, you know, just specific to that, we have seen, uh, you know, manufacturers, uh, you know, uh, do, do a change where, where it's prudent and possible uh, to actually uh, can, you know, to uh, be able to supply to that need uh, that uh, the pandemic has unfortunately offered. Um, but, you know, in terms of uh, uh, the supply chain as uh, into other industries, we, we, we do see quite a bit of crossover. There, there are some that are very pure in terms of what they're, look, uh, you know, offering to mining uh, or exploration, but we do see a, a, a multi-sector approach by, by several of them, just by virtue of the commodity market cycles. So, so they've learned to, to endure over a period of time. There's a, there's a need to kind of do that. What we're seeing right now is um, not so much the, the existing players, but the new entrants to the market are, are diversifying and pivoting, if you will, uh, seeing that their, their new technologies are, are of, uh, applicable to the industry. So we're seeing new technologies enter the market that typically hadn't seen or, or focused on this industry before. So, uh, you know, that's some of the stuff, uh, some of the exciting stuff more in the R&D and innovation area is, you know, looking at microwave technologies and, and seeing all that kind of come in. And of course, uh, sensor technologies and all that. Uh, if there's one lesson to learn, though, in all this, as we embrace these new technologies, is the fundamental importance of that infrastructure. The backbone of telecommunications in, in, in these countries is going to be even more crucial as we, as we move to these more modern and uh, uh, what we would call uh, more demanding in terms of bandwidth uh, technologies. So um, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. And uh, over to you, Jamie. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think what really struck me when I moved over from the climate environment space to, to the natural resource space is that you know, in, in climate environment space, there's incredibly strong, incredibly forceful women that are really leading a lot of the agenda. 
Um, and when I came over to Extractives, I saw that there was almost a backslide. This idea that if you're going to support women's empowerment um, through natural resources, well, you need to look at the cottage industries. Women can cook, women can sew, um, you know, they can, they can farm. That's what we should be investing in. But that's, that's not all that women can do. Um, women can lead, women can innovate. And breaking that mindset that empowering women means cottage industries, empowering me women means setting up crafts and little artisan stalls and understanding that empowering women means showing when you have Canadian companies going into Africa that women are taking positions of responsibility and engaging with women as innovators in Africa is critical for women's empowerment in, in natural resource. And the second issue is that there's really still a need to address some of the fundamental barriers, specifically in things like licensing and rights, access rights. Um, this is particularly the case in Africa where you still have cases where women may have rights to what's above the ground, but they still don't have rights to what's below the ground. But this needs to be done in partnership with the governments. And this is where GAC and the government of Canada really needs to step up and say, we are going to support these reforms. We're gonna support changes in governance in licensing rules and regulations to ensure that we're not excluding women from, um, from natural resource management and exploitation because of fundamental barriers in the legislation and the policy space. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, more questions coming through. I'll do another round of three. Uh, learn more, Nyamadzanga is asking the question, how, and I'll give this to you, Ben, how have Canadian companies tried to encourage other mining companies in Africa to follow some of the best practice shared today? Um, it's added here yeah, that we need more of this in Africa, so certainly a, a vote of confidence from the continent, and keep doing the good work. That's a message to each one of you. So that's the first question, Ben. The second question is for you, Wayne. Got a question out of Zimbabwe around a company that's seeking to list on the TSX or raise private finance. Um, any thoughts on best practice or top things to keep in mind? And tied to the question is, what role does Mine Africa play to help companies in getting into Canada and raising finance? And the final question, tying to those wonderful comments that you made, Jamie, around women being involved in just more than cottage industries. And this question is to you, Nassim. Any thoughts or points of advice for uh, those on the continent watching this um, who want to get in and lead and do what you're doing and take control, um, you know, and pioneer the sorts of innovation that you're delivering because you are, um, and you're very humble about it, but the first female executive of a mining company in Botswana's history. Um, so some thoughts and inspiration on that uh, would certainly be welcomed. So we'll go in that order. First question to you, Ben. Great, thanks. Uh, great question. Uh, there's several different ways. I mean, one of the most important ways, I think, is the leadership that Canadian mining companies play in their national chambers of mines. Uh, I mean, everywhere we go, uh, especially in Africa, we work with the, the, the our counterparts. Canadian mines are are playing a very active role in sharing best practices. Uh, Lucara, for instance, in our you know in our role in our work with the Botswana Chamber of Mines around TSM, uh, played a real leadership role in helping to bring the uh, the national industry in Botswana. Um, forward in, in adopting TSM. And actually that, that initiative has played a key role. I and mean, our members are enormously supportive of the work that we've been doing to share TSM freely with other chambers of minds to allow them to benefit without cost uh, from the work that we've done to establish good practice standards in key environmental and social areas. So, you know, the offer is freely out there to, to all uh, chambers to, to work with us. And then other things we do are like annual presences at the mining in Dabo, where we have organized a panel on the main stage for several years that is meant to highlight uh, good practices that are evolving in both Canada, but also with Canadian mining companies in Africa to educate the industry on, on innovations in these areas. So it's a very active uh, program of work to, to try to share these, these practices. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, Wayne, to address uh, the question you received. Yeah, well, thank you very much. And what um, we'd be happy to do there is I could share with you the uh, detailed listing requirements for both the Toronto Stock Exchange and the Venture Exchange that outlines the requirements for doing that. In terms of um, seeking financing here in Canada, that's what we do at Mine Africa. We assist companies that are trying to raise financing. We can make useful introductions for you to potential investors. And um, um, 
in terms of that process, I mean, uh, quite, we get a lot of inquiries to that degree from Africa, and quite often there's not a lot of detailed geological work done. So I would suggest that, you know, we can have this conversation offline, but one of the uh, real challenges is for um, African uh, junior mining companies looking to get some financing is you have to have what's called a 43101 or some degree of detailed geological work done on your project and not just mineral rights, for example. So I'd be happy, as I mentioned, to discuss that offline. Thank you. Thanks very much. And the next question was to you, Nassim. Thanks, Gareth. It's, uh, <laughs> so, yeah, what would I say to the people out there that want to, to lead and, well, you know, mining has always been gender diverse, but not necessarily inclusive, right? So, bottom line is, I think it's, it's taken me 17 years to get to where I am. And um, what I believe is that when the doors are open, it gives other people opportunity. And let me just take it a little back uh, to, to diversity. So bottom line is gender diversity and inclusivity. Inclusivity, we have gender diversity. So in, in layman's terms, I'm now invited to the party, but when we're inclusive, we're saying let's dance together. So right now what Lucara has done and what Lucara has done is open the floodgates for women, specifically in Botswana, because now we're not being put in a box. I've been promoted by a female CEO and organically, it, it was not because I was female, it was because I fit the profile. And when I say I fit the profile, it was more around competencies, right? So I was able to do the job and I had the experience. And likewise, for, for the rest of the women that came after us, so we don't work on a quota basis here in Botswana. So Botswana's laws are very good in terms of gender, gender diversity. It's how the companies actually bring this to, to fruition. And I think with Lukara, we do things very differently. So what has happened with me being promoted to this role here, it's giving people the opportunity to see that females can actually lead in the diamond industry. And what is unique about my promotion is that I've always been told that I'm a commercial person because I'm a, a chartered accountant by profession. So getting into this role was very difficult, specifically because I was not technical, because I was more on the commerce side. So exco levels, you'll always get female sitting in the non-technical aspects and COO, CEO positions were very difficult to get. But now it's with this promotion here, it is actually giving other women the opportunity and not the opportunity per se, but giving other women the courage to actually apply for jobs like this because they now can see it's something that's doable. So what would I say to women out there is work extremely hard as everyone else here. It's taken me 17 years to get to where I am and focus on the prize. Don't ever, ever take no as an answer. Always persevere and eventually you'll get there. And your dreams, you know, everyone has dreams, but the, the turnout of the dream is your perseverance and ensuring that you're actually a go-getter in getting those dreams. So never give up and don't ever let anyone tell you that you can't achieve the dreams that you want. Because I've done it, it's taken me 17 years, it's a long time and I think with the work that we're doing, and I'm sure Jane can, uh, Jamie can actually attest to this, is that we are paving the platform for people to actually, or women specifically, to come to the forefront and we're giving them the courage to actually get to these levels because it's doable. Nassim, thank, thank you. you so much. And uh, powerful, truthful remarks to conclude this session. The feedback is incredible. I, I, we're not gonna get to all the questions, but I will be making direct contact to connect some of you who do have outstanding questions with our speakers today. I wanna to thank each one of you personally on behalf of the board, uh, on behalf of our members. Um, I wanna thank Global Affairs. Canada is a leader, that is beyond doubt. And the ability to do good and to transform economies in real partnership is demonstrated. A lot of work still lies ahead and each one of you are pioneers with your organizations in achieving exactly that. Uh, we have our summit. 27, 28, and 29 October, here in Toronto, Africa Accelerating. It'll be broadcast for thousands across the world. So please tune in for that. Check out our website, uh, register. And thank you to Lucara Diamond, uh, Lucara Botswana, specifically for making that happen. You know, so often we think sponsorships and the like are going to come from Canada for events. 
uh, in Africa, but you've certainly you know, changed that and shown this really is a partnership of equals across the board, and we will continue to persist and deliver that. Our next webinar is taking place in September. We'll send out information to each one of you in an email that will include follow-up with presentations from today. Um, please feel free to reach out to me, Gareth at CanadaAfrica.ca, for any questions you may have. My details are online too, and we'll do our best as timelessly as possible to ensure that we connect you with the right people and resources. Thank you once again to each one of you. Have a fabulous rest of your afternoons or evenings, wherever you are. And we look forward to seeing you all again at our webinar early next month. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thanks all. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you all. You, Bye. Have a good Bye. day.